Hello, my name is Karen Mukta, and I'm a professor of politics and international relations at Karl Foskar University in Venice. Um, and I work on the intersection of Turkey's domestic and foreign policies, and hence on autocratization and its manifestation in Turkey's relations with the world today. Now I'd like to start with a big thanks to Dr. Tunar Dinch and the Turkey Beyond Borders team. I think uh, in these days, their commitment to maintaining spaces for critical research on Turkey uh, and beyond is really important. We're going through uh, a time of deepening autocratization in Turkey. There's no question about that, but we see increasing threats to the freedom of thought and inquiry in Europe and in the United States. Um, and uh, hence, these venues are really important. So thank you very much for the invitation. Now, in this seminar, I will actually examine issues which are uh, very closely connected to issues of human rights. I will examine the political and discursive context that has governed minority policies in Turkey. My focus is on state policies towards those groups and individuals that have been considered as being outside the boundaries of Turkishness. Looking at minorities and the state policies toward them actually allows us to engage a number of issues ranging from the inclusivity of a political regime and the provisions and limits of citizenship to the repertoires of contestation and resilience in Turkey and beyond. It tells us much about minorities, but it also tells us about the self-understanding and power of those who consider themselves as part of the majority. And it gives us clues about where and among which ethno-religious groups state power is located. It also gives us insights into how notions like race, class, and gender intersect with projects of nation building and nation state policies. Of course, my case here is Turkey, but many of the themes discussed are relevant for more or less all nation states, but particularly for countries like Germany and Israel, where, like in Turkey, a larger uh, genocidal framework or a genocidal reference point complicates the past, present, and future of minorities, of democracy, and of inclusivity. Now, in order to kind of get to this um, large complex of issues, I will start by positing the centrality of Turkishness as the core dispositive that creates and regulates minorities and majorities in Turkey and the relations between them. I will then examine in more detail state policies towards non-Muslim minorities, but also looking at their contestation or their the resistance to it, um, um, trying to show that, above all, they try to bring to an end the presence of these uh, communities within the Turkish Republic, of course, starting with the Lausanne Treaty and the exchange of populations. And I will then focus on communities that are generally considered as Muslim, but not as Turkish, and their differential experiences ranging from conditional inclusion through assimilation to denial and ethnic cleansing. But first, I would like to start with two vignettes, one from the current celebrations uh, of the Turkish Republic, uh, you know, the, the centenary in October uh, 2023 and November as well, and another one from my recent fieldwork in the Greek community of the Istanbul district of Kadıköy. Okay, so on 10 November 2023, the commemorative events in honor of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Turkish state or the Turkish Republic, were even more pronounced than they have been in the last few years. The commemorations constituted the high point of a series of events celebrating the Turkish Republic's centenary on 29 October 2023. These celebrations took place in an environment of deepening autocratic consolidation and Islamist ne neoliberalism that is, of course, paradigmatically opposed to the tenets of the Kemalist Republic. Hence, uh, most of the celebrations were therefore organized by the opposition, or I should probably here say by the Turkish opposition, uh, and especially the uh, Republican People's Party. Festivals, marches, and vigils organized uh, by municipalities governed by the Republican People's Party hence served a double goal. They were as much about celebrating the achievements of the Republic as they were manifestations against the Erdogan regime. In Istanbul alone, hundreds of thousands showed up to these vigils. Uh, they formed human chains. Um, they, these were big festivities. Uh, there were public concerts. 
um, uh, and of course uh, a lot of uh, hero uh, worship. Uh, TV channels of the mainstream opposition dedicated their entire day's programming uh, to the commemoration of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, particularly on uh, 10th November, uh, his, uh, um, uh, the anniversary of his death. Uh, the breakfast program of Halk TV, or People's TV, which is one of the most influential opposition outlets, ran the Twitter hashtag, uh, X Twitter hashtag, Mahjubus i.e. we're embarrassed or ashamed. Ismail Küçükkaya, the host, suggested that the Turkish Republic was a major historical achievement that laid the foundations of modern Turkey and, uh, quote, unquote, uh, made us what we are, but that the country's current state under the AKP was an embarrassment and an insult to the memory of Atatürk. He then encouraged viewers uh, to use the hashtag uh, to share what they missed about the Republic uh, under this hashtag. And later in the program, he then read out some of these tweets he found most appropriate for the occasion. Now, according to the tweets he um, selected, most viewers tweeted about how they cherished the achievements of the Republic and its policies based on scientific decision-making and rational thinking, as opposed to the Islamist policies of the AKP regime. They expressed that they longed for more democratic politics, a better education system, a more equal economy, and generally a less polarized society. Others simply indicated that they were longing for Atatürk, his genius, and his leadership, and for better times, which they specifically associated with his term in office, uh, and more generally with the years before the AKP's rise to power in 2002. Now, my second vignette is from an interview which I conducted with a board member of the Foundation of Greek Orthodox Churches, Schools, uh, and Cemeteries in Kadiköy, Yorgos Stefanopoulos. A professor emeritus of electrical engineering and former chair of the same foundation, Professor Stefanopoulos is the most prominent member uh, of um, uh, the Greek community of Kadiköy. The community has now around 300 members, you know, down from tens of thousands uh, 50 years ago, most of them well above retirement age. He has witnessed and survived several acts of anti-minority policies, mass violence and atrocities orchestrated by the Turkish state from the September pogroms of 1955 to the expulsion of Greek passport holders in 1964. Since then, he's been at the forefront of keeping the Greek community of Kadiköy alive, or at least trying to um, engage in uh, events which uh, reminded the public that there still are Greeks in Kadiköy. He emphasizes that the community suffered a lot over uh, the times over the years, um, but he almost um, looks back <laughs> with nostalgia at the fact that, uh, you know, when the community was bigger, it was, uh, of course, attracting a lot of um, uh, interest from the state, which, which wasn't benign, um, but they felt uh, like a real part of, um, of well, they, they felt alive at least. But, um, uh, but he said, uh, and I quote, so few of us are left that they, i.e. the Turkish state here, have actually stopped bothering us. We have become so few that we are too insignificant to be considered even as enemies. It is almost like we don't exist anymore. And I think this quote really shows that, um, uh, you know, one of the unwritten goals of the Turkish Republic, i.e. to get rid of the non-Muslim minorities, uh, has certainly worked uh, in the case uh, of the Greek uh, community, which is now um, uh, down to a ne negligible number. And I believe that these two different vignettes lead us to two insights that I find central uh, to the quest to be the central to the question of how minorities have fared in the Turkish Republic. The Twitter users on the morning program of Halk TV may be frightened, and they are, of course, about the prospects of uh, further autocratization and Islamization under President Erdogan, but they uniformly and proudly claim a Republican history which they believe was better, more hopeful, more inclusive for women, even sexual minorities, and above all, which was a history which was theirs. They, 
and the hundreds of thousands of participants in the anniversary events do this by waving Tur Turkish flags, by singing nationalist marches, or by visiting the mausoleum of Atatürk. So you can see they can mobilize the entire repertoire of the Turkish nation building project and its symbols, even if some of these uh, symbols have now become a bit more contested. And this is why many Turkish flags waved at these manifestations are slightly modified and sport an integrated portrait of Atatürk. In this way, supporters of the Kemalist Republic distinguish themselves from the current owners of the Turkish state, who imagine a republic purged of its secular modernist Kemalist heritage. Now, the important observation here is that the commemorating Turks have something to look back to, which they believe is theirs, which is benign and welcoming and full of success. And even if they also, uh, even if they also mourn the loss of their status as the privileged owners of the state at the moment, or at least partly. Then, of course, there are people who identify with the current regime, with the AKP regime, and uh, who believe that the same symbols and the institutions of the state represent them, and they have the confidence of acting as the current owners of the Turkish state. So, uh, you know, even though Turkey is now very polarized and there is a major difference between uh, secular Turkish middle classes and um, uh, and um, Islamist leaning or non-secular uh, supporters uh, of uh, uh, the AKP both still own most of the symbolic and uh, factual repertoire of the Turkish Republic. In contradistinction, Professor Stefanopoulos looks back at a history of state orchestrated repression as well as structural and manifest violence that has reduced this once, his once thriving community of hundreds of thousands of Greeks in Istanbul alone to a couple uh, of thousand mostly elderly uh, survivors. Now, how can we explain these two diametrically opposed trajectories of memory, especially when we also take into uh, consideration that, of course, Professor Stefanopoulos or any Greek or any Armenian uh, from Istanbul uh, remembers this history of violence and of uh, exclusion by the state, whereas most Muslim Turks do not. So more importantly, how can Turks remember the Republic uh, as a positive heritage while Greeks or Kurds cannot? And one obvious answer is, of course, given by uh, Barış Ünlü in his important book, uh, on the Turkishness contract, which came out in 2018 and more recently uh, in 2023, uh, there's also a um, uh, English uh, language uh, version available. Um, and of course, he also contributed to uh, Turkey Beyond Borders with one of the first videos in this uh, um, uh, video log. So um, check out his uh, presentation too. Now, Ünlü's approach is very much formed by his engagement with post-colonial and whiteness studies um, and the central dispositive of white privilege in organizing societal power in the United States and Europe, and of course in their um, uh, colonies. So this is very much a post-colonial approach um, uh, used to understand the Turkish case. And in the Turkish case, he argues, the equivalent to the whiteness contract is the Turkishness contract. Um, and of course, it's precondition of Muslimness. So what he then calls the Muslimness contract, which uh, creates the basis of the Turkishness uh, uh, con contract. So uh, basically, he argues that uh, during the dissolution of the uh, Ottoman Empire, and especially in the decade ranging from the Balkan Wars to World War I, and the Greco-Turkish War, a consensus emerged among Muslims in today's Turkey. And here I quote him, uh, in the entirety of this consensus and partnership were two basic provisos, uh, though unwritten, were, that though unwritten were known to all. First, to live a secure and privileged life in Anatolia, one had to be a Muslim. And two, no one is to tell the truth about what was done and will be done to non-Muslims no one is to sympathize with them or engage in politics on their behalf. And then, of course, uh, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, to that was then later uh, added uh, the, the, the condition that one also has to be a Turkish secular, uh, uh, one had to be Turkish and Muslim, but also secular in order to um, benefit 
from the privilege of Turkishness. So let's look at the non-Muslim communities after the Lausanne uh, Treaty and uh, how they were constructed and dealt with and experienced um, subjecthood and uh, being a minority. The very text of the Lausanne Treaty, uh, which uh, stipulated the exchange of, quote, Muslims in Greece with, quote, Orthodox Christian in Turkey, is actually a, a case of the first proviso. Aslı Isis, in her book Humanism in Ruins, refers to the Greek-Turkish population exchange as a case of segregative uh, biopolitics, uh, or what she calls a policy of conflict resolution and nation building based on the racial and cultural unmixing of peoples, which also, of course, René Hirschhorn in her uh, very important 1989 book with a second edition, which came out this year in 2023 on the Greek-Turkish a population ex, uh, change explores. And thereby, she, um, ISIS also reminds us of the ideological and factual proximity of Muslim Turkish nationalism and, you know, for example, Zionism and its quest to create a Jewish state in Palestine. The denial of and the refusal to sympathize with the fate of non-Muslims in the late empire has been most pronounced with regard to the Armenian genocide. Fatma Mugegecek, in her epic Denial of Violence, shows how this denialism and the inability to empathize uh, with non-Muslims preceded the formation of a Muslim political identity by more than a century, actually. After the foundation of the Turkish Republic and its preference for a secular, uh, for set secular ethno-racial definitions of Turkishness, this arrangement was then transposed into a Turkishness contract, where both provisos, of course, were sustained. Muslimness remained the precondition for becoming a Turk and for gaining full citizenship rights and acting as one of the owners of the state. This meant that non-Muslim non groups were categorically denied the right to equal citizenship, but one could even say that they were uh, denied the right to citizenship full stop. They were subjected to a range of state policies, often involving mass violence and the mobilization of local populations against them as well, that reminded the non-Muslim minorities of the larger genocidal frame within which their existence in the Turkish Republic was sometimes tolerated and sometimes not. So, of course, you know, um, we have to see that this uh, that the shadow of the Armenian genocide of 1915, even more maybe than the Lausanne exchange of population, has been, uh, let's say, the emotive or effective framework of being a minority uh, in um, Turkey from the inception of the Republic until our very days. Structural violence against non-Muslim communities, and here, of course, I refer to the so-called Lausanne minorities, the Greek, Armenian, and Jewish communities, was therefore built into the legal and administrative apparatus of the Turkish Republic and its minority regime. Members of these communities were denied equal access to education and employment opportunities, and they were subjected to discriminating behavior from state agencies but also uh, uh, experienced discrimination in everyday interactions with uh, ordinary citizens, Muslim citizens. Non-Muslims were constructed as internal foreigners and never seen, never, in no example of state discourse or public discourse, never seen as equal citizens. From the perspective of Turkey's state elites, whether Kemalist or after the 1950s, right-wing liberals or leftists, Non-Muslims did not belong in Turkey. This implicit state paradigm, paradigm was, of course, all the more relevant as the project of a Turkish Muslim, a pure Turkish Muslim nation, had not fully materialized after Turkish independence. Due to the provisions of the Lausanne Treaty, Greeks in Istanbul and two islands in the northern Aegean were exempted from the population exchange. Many Armenian communities who had survived the genocide still existed in Anatolia. Jewish communities were also thriving in the Aegean, uh, as well as in most major cities, until 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel, but also after it. As in Israel, historical contingency therefore made the creation of a purely Muslim state in Anatolia unachievable in the short run. However, the objective to minimize the non-Muslim communities to the point of erasure 
was certainly one of the unwritten but foundational objectives of the Republic. The structural conditions of discrimination and exclusion were for, further aggravated in times of crisis when non-Muslim communities were physically targeted by state action and sometimes uh, mass violence. The pogroms in 1934 that targeted the Jewish communities of trace and led to their mass immigration to Istanbul is the first in a long list. Uh, the wealth tax followed in 1942 with the outward aim of preventing war profiteering, but in fact, uh, it was launched, uh, of course, to redistribute non-Muslim property and capital to the emerging Muslim Turkish bourgeoisie. The September pogroms of 1955 were initially directed at the country's Greeks, uh, connected to the Cyprus conflict, but they quickly turned against all non-Muslim communities and led to a massive uh, loss of lives and property, massive trauma in the community, um, mass rape, uh, particularly uh, in, in some uh, neighborhoods of Istanbul. The Greek community was very much uh, affected by this event, but uh, actually it was another event which most scholars agree uh, uh, broke uh, the, the spirit of the Greek community, if you so will. And this was the expulsion of Greek uh, passport holders in 1964, which then led to the uh, exodus of more than 60,000 people. Um, and, uh, you know, there's amazing research by Eli Romano Erst, but also more recently by Elif Kevsa Özer, uh, who have shown um, uh, how this um, uh, exodus was organized and how it changed uh, the uh, remaining Greek community. With the combined effect of these conditions and state policies, Turkey's non-Muslim communities have been severely reduced. Uh, the Greek community can barely keep open their more than 80 churches and dozens of cemeteries and schools in Istanbul. Um, the arrival in Istanbul of many Arabic speakers of the Greek Orthodox right from Hatay, you know, with the work of Özgür Kaymak and Haris Rigas here uh, has been um, very important, has only led to a minimal reinvigoration of community life and also the uh, arrival of uh, uh, um, uh, Russians and Ukrainians who now come to uh, services uh, in these uh, uh, churches might have kind of in, in livened, uh, made these uh, places more lively, but they are not really um, uh, helping the community to survive. The Armenian community of Istanbul counts almost 50,000 members, uh, so it's a much larger community, and there are many more who claim Armenian origin, but who have been raised as Turkish or Kurdish uh, and as Muslim, uh, but who feel connected to the Armenian community in one way or the other. And precisely due to these larger numbers and their relative visibility in the political field, Armenians continue to be targets of discriminative behavior by state agencies as well by extreme right-wing groups collaborating with the state. And of course, the murder of uh, the prominent journalist, newspaper owner of Agos and civil rights activist Shantink in 2007 is... Um, a, uh, is a prime example for this. The Jewish community went through comparable experiences of discrimination and migration with the foundation of the State of uh, Israel in 1948, constituting the most important rupture in the community. But still, uh, even after 1948, uh, there was a large uh, Jewish community uh, which, whose numbers, however, have been dwindling over quite a, uh, a number of years. Today's community consists of less than 20,000 members in Istanbul and Izmir, and of course its members have to negotiate a reinvigorated anti-Semitism that is fueled by Israel's war on Palestine and the kind of Islamist rhetoric uh, which has taken hold in Turkey thanks to more than two decades of AKP uh, power. Despite this context of relentless discrimination, Armenians, Greeks, or Jews, and Jews were never solely the victims of the Turkish state, of course. They were also resilient actors who carried on community lives despite the odds. Laina Ekmekjolo, in her 2016 Recovering Armenia, the Limits of Belonging in Post-Genocide Turkey, explores how Armenian feminists continued to reconstruct their community after uh, uh, their communities after the genocide and, and how they also believe that they might have a future in Turkey. 
The Greek community's dedication to its institutions and to the idea of ensuring the survival of a polites identity, i.e. the residents of Constantinopolis, uh, that establishes a symbolic link with the founders of the city uh, has uh, already been mentioned. So you know, their work uh, has been epic in trying to keep all these institutions, all these schools and churches alive but um, uh, considering the size of the community, it's uh, a Sisyphean uh, task beyond, uh, beyond any imagination. Shanting's activism for a more inclusive Turkey during the relatively hopeful years of Turkey's accession negotiations with the European Union in the early 2000s was probably the most daring example of non-Muslim subjecthood in Turkey. That it ended with his assassination by a young man with clear and obvious connections to Turkey's security apparatus reminds us of the razor sharp limits of non Muslim subjecthood in Turkey. Now, let's move from the Muslim minorities, sorry, the non Muslim minorities, i.e., those minorities who for a long time in Turkey were seen as the only officially defined minorities according to Lausanne to non-Turkish Muslim minorities and their trajectories towards or outside Turkishness. For non-Turkish Muslim uh, communities or for Muslim non-Turkish communities, the Turkishness contract worked differently and at times in a more benign fashion by offering an albeit narrow trajectory of inclusion by assimilation. Muslim refugees from the Balkans or the Caucasus were generally welcome and eventually also considers, uh, considered as Turks, as long as they demonstrated their acceptance of the narrative of Turkishness, including the denial of violence against non-Muslims. As many of them brought with them the experience of violence inflicted by Christian nation states or empires on them, they could easily feel at home in this narrative. So they didn't have to kind of bend too much in order to fit into this uh, into this uh, binary uh, narrative on uh, Christians versus Muslims. This assimilationist inclusion also applied to small and non-Turkish Muslim communities, particularly in the Black Sea region, which were able to hold on to their language and customs at home while they performed Turkishness in public. I would like to draw your attention here to the work of Erol Salam and Yamur Dönmez in, in, in uh, 2022, uh, on the Greek-speaking communities of the Eastern Black Sea region that continue speaking Greek in intimate spaces while they are embodying uh, a Turkish nationalist identity in public. Assimilation was much less of an option for the two largest and partly overlapping minorities or communities or groups of the Alevis and, Tur and Kurds. Turkish-speaking Alevis could, of course, um, despite widespread religious prejudice, benefit from uh, the provisions of the Republic's relative secularity. The highest echelons of administrative and military decision-making, uh, however, remained largely inaccessible to them. By contrast, Turkey's Kurds were forcibly denied as a group and classified as a potential threat to public order from the start. With the Sheikh Said rebellion in 1925 and its suppression, racial, racial and genocidal frames and anti kurdish sentiment was built into the foundations of the early republic. Racial and genocidal frames determined the state's interaction with Kurds throughout the history of the republic and continue to do so uh, today, especially now that the AKP is in a governing coalition with the Nationalist Action Party, uh, which has been carrying on these racial and genocidal frames uh, through uh, to our days. But of course, this was always coupled both with assimilationist pressures, but also with assimilationist uh, offers, if you so will. Constituting the majority population in most of the country's eastern and southeastern provinces, movements for the recognition of Kurdish language and history were never completely suppressed, of course, and it was in the 1980s that it took the form of a military struggle with the guerrilla war launched by the Kurdish Workers' Party, uh, PKK, Partia Kalkeran Kurdistan. And, it's in, it, and of course, in response to this, a large-scale 
uh, war, ethnic cleansing and destruction. Many Kurds uh, were pushed out of uh, Kurdistan to the cities of the West and after migration to Western Turkey in the 1980s and 90s, many were assimilated, but many others continued the use of Kurdish in the family and continued also to identify as Kurdish in one way uh, of, or, or, or the other. A very important moment here were the attempts at limited autom autonomy in local governments held by pro-Kurdish parties in the 2000s. These created counter-hegemonic spaces in which alternatives were offered to the Turkishness contract. In the Arbakus historical Sur municipality, Mayor Abdullah Demirbaş, for instance, introduced a policy of multiculturalism and multilingualism, providing municipality services in Kurdish and Turkish and making visible in the public space the city's historical languages like Armenian and Syria. Now, considering the larger genocidal context, the appearance of Armenian letters on the building of the municipality of Sur and on motorway signs was uh, nothing short of revolutionary. And so was uh, the commitment to Kurdish as a language of education, of politics, and of culture. It was, all, it was also in this period that Turkey's only memorial for the victims of the Armenian genocide uh, was inaugurated in the Arbakir in Sur, actually. Um, together with the debates launched by Jean Tink and his Agos newspaper on a more inclusive future of Turkey, the Kurdish movement's municipalities in the 2000s emerged as veritable laboratories for alternatives to the hegemonic ideology of Turkishness. But as the former, this Kurdish uh, experiment was also cut short violently with the removal from office and incarceration of more, most Kurdish uh, uh, mayors already after the coup attempt of 2016, and then the subsequent securitization of the Kurdish movement uh, in the following years, and then after the 2019 local elections, when almost all Kurdish mayors were expelled. Today, there is no trace of Armenian or Assyrian left in the public space of the Albakr. Sur has been partly destroyed uh, during clashes between the state and Kurdish groups. And uh, also, the language Kurdish has become much less visible in uh, the public space in Kurdistan and in the Arbakir. Now, so far I've explored the dispositive whereby minorities have been either assimilated into Turkishness or have been excluded from the right to live in Turkey unharmed or actually from the right to live. This citizenship regime or minority regime was shaped by the arrangements, communities and conditions of the first century of the Turkish Republic and its particular place in global space and time. Some things may turn out differently in the second. While the larger dispositive of the Turkishness contract is still in place, its content and the involved people are changing as well. First, the Islamist political elites of the Justice and Development Party have systematically reinterpreted Turkishness through the lens of political Islam and made conservative politics of gender, a core value of it, of Turkishness now. While the beneficiaries of the Turkishness contract uh, used to be secular and Kemalist, today full membership in the body, body politic requires not only nominal, but active membership uh, um, in the community of Muslim believers. The new Turkishness contract also excludes non-religiously orientated women and men and members of LGBTQI communities who are dismissed as uh, non-national, though the national here, of course, stands not so much for the ethnic community, but the larger imagined Muslim community, the Ummah. And of course, Alevis also do not have uh, a, a place in this kind of new definition of Turkishness. This reorientation towards Islam as a central organizing category has made it also easier for some, for conservative Kurds, for instance, and members of other uh, minorities to share in the spoils of uh, the AKP uh, power project without having to deny their ethnic background. At the same time, this reorientation has also deeply unsettled the secular Turkish middle classes who experience the exclusion from the privilege of Turkishness or of white Turkishness uh, as a major humiliation. Secondly, 
some communities have now almost disappeared while new ones have arrived. In the urban landscape of metropolitan Istanbul with almost 20 million inhabitants, the old non-Muslim communities have become numerically, politically, and to a very large extent, also culturally insignificant. I mean, the urban core of Istanbul is, of course, still shaped by the presence of churches, synagogues, and the vernacular architecture of Greeks, Armenians, and Jews, as well as by cemeteries, by Ayyazma, Ay Holy Springs. Yet increasingly, they do not serve the needs of their original communities, but they act as canvases of multicultural mise-en-scene by culturally savvy millennials. A woman in her 20s, whom I encountered in the small chapel of a former Greek restaurant in Moda, for instance, told me, uh, and I quote, whenever I come to Kocho, that's the name of, uh, of the restaurant, I also go down to the Ayazma, and I always light a candle. It's nice to be here. It's mystical. It's part of Istanbul's multicultural past. And of course, past here is, uh, is the key word because this is not really anymore part of Istanbul's multicultural pres presence. present. Istanbul's and Turkey's multicultural future is indeed a different one, shaped by the large movements of flight and migration, especially from Syria, and the Muslim Middle East, but also from Africa and Central Asia, as well as now also from Russia and Ukraine. Until now, there seems to be little in terms of strategic thinking among the AKP's political elites on whether and how newcomers can be and should be integrated into Turkey's polarized society. So for now, there is no Turkishness contract 2.0 in sight. Based on our discussion so far, it would be reasonable to expect, however, that Muslim immigrants will be more likely to be considered for assimilation into the Turkish body politic, uh, at least more likely than non-Muslims. But this may change. Uh, existing arrangements of inclusion and exclusion for old minorities will certainly not fade away easily. Uh, yet societies are never quite as foreseeable as states would like to have them to be. And new uh, immigrants may eventually change definitions of Turkishness from within. In multicultural neighborhoods of Istanbul, like Beylik Düzü, Turkishness uh, as an identity proposal is only one among many others. Uh, you know, there's Syrian, African, Central Asian communities. But of course, still today, as in the multicultural neighborhoods of Germany or France, um, uh, there's only one identity which uh, remains tied to state power, and that is the Turkish uh, identity proposal. Which brings me really to my conclusion. Mobilizing insights from Barış Ünlü's Turkishness contract, I sought to show why the Kemalist middle classes who are now celebrating the centennial of the Republic have a history uh, of their own to look back to with longing and trepidation about uh, regarding the current situation, whereas Yorgos Stefanopoulos is overseeing the final demise of his own community and Kurds live in a society which ultimately rejects them. The minority regime that emerged out of the late Ottoman Empire, the War of Independence, and the early Republic was unforgiving and meant to be genocidal for the non-Muslim minorities. For all others, it opened differentiated if narrow gateways into Turkishness, which if taken allowed Kurds, Laz, Bosniaks, Albanians, and sometimes in, in very limited uh, fashion Roma to become respected Turkish citizens. Any resistance, however, to this assimilationist model led to repeated uh, episodes of state violence that we can only understand within the framework of the larger constitution uh, uh, within the larger framework of uh, within the framework of the larger genocidal constitution of the Turkish Republic, the nation state almost anywhere is based on power arrangements that put into its core a privileged ethnic or religious group or the light culture of that group, the leading culture, as in Germany, the majority culture. The extent to which others in a given polity are treated decently. I'm not even talking about equality here, but uh, the extent to which they are treated decently depends on a range of factors like the depth of democracy, the autonomy of institutions, and the level of human rights. 
Turkey has never fared well on any of these indicators, but like many other nation states, it combined inclusive policies allowing for assimilation into the privileges of Turkishness with exclusionary policies ranging all the way to ethnic cleansing and genocidal destruction. The Turkish case resonates uh, with countries, of course, like Israel and Germany, where exclusion and inclusion of minorities occurred within a larger genocidal context and where alterity has been addressed with this wide set of policy choices that almost always reinserts the power of the privileged group. There is no doubt that the contestation over this privilege will be at the heart of societal struggles in Turkey, as well as in other nation states that are now witnessing the destruction of the myths of their homogenous nations. Thank you very much.